So my name is Ann Dolan. I'm from Sir John A. McDonald Secondary School. I am a communication technology teacher, a drama teacher, English teacher as well, although I haven't done that in a while. And I've recently picked up my library part one, partly because some of the things that happened when I was experimenting um, that I'm sharing with you today. So uh, the official title is Student Produced Learning Objects, which sounds very official to me, partly because um, I didn't really know that this term existed until not that long ago. I stumbled into this area because of some things I've tried in my classroom. If I was to be truthful, where I came to uh, the experiments I'm going to share with you today is that I really wanted my students to do more of my work in the classroom. I felt that I was doing the work and my students were consuming it, but maybe not working as hard as I was. Emily, thanks for doing that. <laughs> so, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you some of my experiments, a co-creation of a website uh, that I created with my students some iPad videos when I was trying to figure out how to teach grammar in a different way, some screencasts for learning software, and then I want to share with you my failed attempt of making videos for the library. I think it's important that we talk about things that don't go well because it could look all so fantastic that then you go, well, I can't do that. I've definitely had my trial by error. Welcome, everybody. I want to give you a definition of a learning object. A learning object is any digital resource that can be reused or support learning. When you go through the literature, David Wiley is often credited with this definition, and you'll notice that the year 2000 is when he started talking about it. And so that was kind of shocking to me as a teacher, because I was like, learning object, that's a term? 2000? I should know this by now. It's 2016. Um, Student-produced learning object is when a student makes the learning object to support the learning, and that it gets reused. I want to share with you some of my thinking behind how I got here because I stumbled into this area rather than actually going out to say, okay, we're making student learning, student produced learning objects. Um, and it goes back to a, a text that I read in 2010 for an AQ. I brought it here in case anyone's interested. I've tried to get several people to read it over the years. So uh, I think, Ken, I've tried to get you to read it at one point. I've read it. You've read it. Perfect. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Things that I, I love about this book is this idea of partnering, but I sometimes feel badly for Mark Prensky, who's like one of those tech edu gurus that sometimes I think maybe it's just a normal teacher that has just decided to share more. Um, his title is partnering, his subtitle is partnering for real learning. I think that's where the power is in this book, is this idea of partnering. This idea of digital natives is a little bit controversial, this idea that our students know how to do things in the digital world um, and grow up that way. I think it's stolen focus from his book to some degree. But he has this concept that teachers really should not be worried about the small details of technology. Rather, we should be worried more about our pedagogy of how we're working with our students who are using that technology. In one section of the book, he goes on to make a very sort of dramatic statement that he says teachers shouldn't even touch the technology. They shouldn't make PowerPoints. My goodness, digital worksheets? Absolutely not. The students should be doing that. And that really pushed my thinking. It's like, what do you mean I don't think to have perfect PowerPoint presentations? I spend a lot of time on those. But he goes on to make this argument, and that started to shift my thinking in a couple of different ways. Um, he, he was really good at articulating what he felt the roles should be in the classroom. So these are the student roles. I'll let you read them. And they, these are the teacher roles that he articulated. And when I go through these roles, I hear lots of echoes of other pedagogical approaches that I've heard throughout the years. Whether it's gradual release, or authentic audiences, or student voice, um, I can sort of connect these to many of the roles that he's articulated. It's just that his articulation helped me think about things differently. With the student, I really love the idea that the student is the researcher. I think understanding how we gain information is really important. Um, thinker and sense maker, that that's what our students are doing. They're learning how to think through things, how to make sense. I aspire that my, my students will be world changers. I feel like I'm still getting there. And I love this idea of self-teacher. When I look at the role of, of, of teachers that he articulates, I'm very comfortable with coach and guide. I like to do that. This idea of goal setter and questioner helped me understand what my role as a feedback. This was pre-AER for me. Um, 
learning designer. This is where I took all my creativity from those PowerPoint presentations and went, oh, I don't have to be creative there. I can be creative in how I facilitate a learning experience. And that's where my creativity comes through, not with how pretty everything looks. Context provider, I've realized that with age, I have a lot more memory than my students, so I'm able to give them some context, and that's often very helpful. And then the rigor provider and quality assurer is something that um, that's where I can critique. The last uh, session's discussion, we are talking about the role of the film critic versus the filmmaker. That we as teachers are the film critic sometimes. We don't make the films, we critique the films. Um, today my students are documenting the presentations and it's been great because I get to actually be a quality assurer and go and look at, okay, are these framed right? That type of thing. So this sparked a change in mindset for me. And so that when I walked through the halls of my school, when I looked at my classroom, what I saw was an underused resource my students. My students needed to do more, to be able to be allowed to do more, to be empowered to do more, and that I didn't have to be working as hard as I was. I needed to delegate better and figure some things out. So I want to share with you some of these experiments that have come through. On the description, it talks about the screencasts or the uh, how-to video. That's where I'll end. But when I was going through this presentation, I realized I had started experimenting far earlier uh, through the Future Forms project. Uh, which I feel really grateful that I had that opportunity because it, it helped me have a, a laboratory to experiment with. So this website was created by a committee of students in my class. That year I had committees. The, one committee was the website, another committee was documentation. We were also looking at civics, so this was a way of looking at citizenship. Uh, they took the pictures. They also developed the little uh, images on the side. This was also connected to creative copyright, this idea of taking pictures versus making pictures. Um, the guided inquiries they made the pictures for. So as we were trying to understand where we'd be going in the classroom, they would make the pictures. What I love about them is how analog or simple they are using Lego, but they're still colorful and help express the meaning of what the students were discovering. They didn't have to be all polished. At the end of that semester, we worked on something called the Grammar Games. Now, uh, that year, I happened to have 24 students. 12 of them were male, 12 of them were female, and the Hunger Games had just come out. So it couldn't be any more perfect to have 12 districts for grammar. Mm -hmm. One male, one female. So they worked together to create these. In this case, the approach of gradual release was really helpful. So we did this video together as a class. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of it. The Escher presents. Of speech. There are eight parts of speech. These form the building blocks of all seven. And I'm going to groove on a little bit. Phrases or clauses. Adjective modifies a noun or a pronoun. Adverb modifies a verb, adjective, and noun. And what I want to point out is that the production quality is quite low, and I know that, and I'm okay with that. That took me a while. The reason why that production quality is low is because we were worried more about the knowledge and the, the understanding. Um, it also kept our timelines condensed. We weren't trying to make a perfect product. We're just trying to develop a learning object. Uh, it was inspired by the common craft movement, which was really hip back then. Um, so they had, they had that as a model. Where they took that, some of them took it to a place where um, it looked very similar. Abstract concrete collect the raw forms of nouns. What is exactly an abstract? But where I want, want to point out my warts, as I call them, is that there's things like this that exist on this website. So there's a spelling error. And when I was looking at this website yesterday, my first instinct was, oh, I should edit that out so that no one, none of the teachers see a spelling error on my website. And I was like, no, okay, I need to be authentic. The reason why I want to point this out is that the students posted this, the students created it. If I was to go back and teach this where I would want to talk about it, what I would want to talk about is the fact that there's a spelling error, but also um, looking at the use of color, looking at how this has a, a jarred look compared to some of the other pages. So it becomes a prototype. I'll mention prototype again, but that idea of a prototype mindset, that you're always building on what has come before you. Um, I'm going to keep moving. A year later, though, I have to say that I was able to do some other videos, I'm not showing them today, that that, that experience helped me better teach making videos in my English classroom again. So it, it paid off in the end, it's just that, that prototype experience. This is my favorite uh, learning object experience so far. 
as a communication technology teacher, I think sometimes uh, people think we just teach software. And certainly software can take up a lot of time in the classroom. Many years ago now, we shift from Corel Draw to Illustrator. At that time, what I had my students do was adapt the concepts that were in the handouts and the, the, uh, the learning materials for Corel Draw and figure out how does it adapt to a new software. And what they did was they had to they had to really be creative in how they figured it out. Once they had figured it out, I asked them to document their skills with a screencast. Uh, we used really low-end um, headphones with a boom mic so that every computer in my lab was an audio computer. I didn't go to my best, my best studio. It was every computer was a studio. Um, we also used freeware software called Screenomatic, but there's others out there. Um, and it's a very simple, low value in one way. So today I'm going to be teaching you guys how to make some basic shoes. But I also didn't allow them to edit it. It had to be a one-take wonder, which meant they had to practice and get, the, get a sense of it. They weren't allowed to record the audio and then write it all out and then edit it, which made, made sure that they were focused when they did it. And that was very, very helpful. Make sure As far as quality control of the products, some of the things that we did was we talked about the use of technical terms, getting other people to listen to it, the whole sense of retakes. Later on in the page, each student also did a more complex character. In the past, this would have taken me a lot of time to teach, because it was me teaching at the front and bringing the class all together at the same time. Now that I have this as a resource, I use it every year, and I've been able to focus more on how do we learn software, what are some skills we need to do to take apart software. This is a resource for you if you want to work all your way through it, like I made my students do eight years ago, and it took them two and a half weeks. You can do that. Or if you want to jump ahead and figure it out and get right to the good stuff, you can do that as well. And so I'm not holding up the students that have the aptitude, but I'm also giving the support to the students that need the extra support and would like to hear instructions again and again and can't figure things out. So this is what I love. And I love, I love the fact that it's pretty simple and that I invested the time one year and it's paid back a year again and again and again and that I didn't have to do it. So I want to talk about my failed attempt. Uh, my failed attempt for the video, it's really stalled, is that I had hoped that my students could make some videos for the library and post them on the website. And I did this in groups. And what it just didn't work. And when I look back, there's probably a couple reasons. Because there wasn't a real connection between what they were making a video about, it was hard for my students to go in and make a little video for the library to put on their website. So that real connection is important to their material. Uh, the other thing was that the group work at that particular moment just didn't help things move forward. It was the students that were working on their own that were able to get the video done, that sense of control. Um, also, I think the fact the subject matter was just too far out of their comfort zone. It wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, it wasn't built upon. It has led me to look more about how to support the library, and I've taken my library part one, and it's something that I want to get back to because I can see a lot of value for putting resources, learning objects on a library website to help sort of give lots of people access to the same information, but at different times and places. Some personal takeaways, uh, prototype mindset. I have words to live by that I've uh, on the wall over here. I've taken them from my classroom. Just really quickly, uh, this good, better, best over here is what my grade 8 teacher drilled into my head. She was like a classic teacher. She spat with her pronunciation, like it was all very precise and we all had to sit and we all had a poem memorized and all those things. And for the perfectionist and everybody, this isn't necessarily, this is great, but not necessarily great when it's holding you up for being able to release things into the world. And so I've had to adopt more of a stance of done is better than perfect. And just get it out and get it up and know that you can always come back to it. The other um, takeaway for me, the gradual release model of teaching is very helpful in these cases where I can model it and then support my students as they become more independent. And then understanding the difference between the content that you want them to be learning or the skills that you want them to be learning. So low production value can be very liberating if you're like, you know what, one take wonders, add videos on your iPad, rather than thinking it has to be a huge production. Connections I want to make really quickly. I think it's really important we talk about how our students are creating their own learning objects in a world where we have Chromebooks in everyone's um, hands because I see this as a huge potential to change the pathways of learning. 
So that's my sort of stance that I want to share with you. Um, I also see it happening at the university level. So there's some links here to a professor named Simon Bates, who's working at UBC. He's a physics teacher, my primer. Uh, this first article here is a lovely article about what's happened in the physics classroom for sheer physics. This learning object guide is the actual assignment from that physics classroom. What I love about this object guide is that it, it sort of takes you through of things to consider. So I would definitely use this as a resource. It also embeds into this idea that the uh, first year physics students have to make at least two learning objects. They have a third option if they want, but also that they're the ch to choose things that are, they're about to read about so they can support other students in their learning, as well as something that isn't simple. Go for something that's a little bit harder that you're having trouble understanding, which I think pairs in nicely with the growth mindset. So that brings me to the end. I wanted to leave time for questions or comments or connections that you made from your own teaching practice and experiences. I think that creating these learning objects is a, is a wonderful tool because we often say to students, you know, we'll Google it and this would be a product. So creating and building upon those resources. Cross-curricularly, with, this, with the soft software that you were using, do you think that that would be easy to pick up? Like you said, you were using kind of lower budget individual at the desktop. So I think what, when you look on the UBC site, they're using a lot of slide decks which are fine, take people through slides. Some of them are using video, but not too many. I think the fact that many students have a smartphone and their ability to capture and to record are right there in their pocket and becoming comfortable with that. So the troubleshooting then is how do you get it from your smartphone, smartphone to the computer. Most of them will upload right into Google Drive. Um, the Chromebooks, uh, these will not work with Chromebooks. My $60 headset will work with Chromebooks. I'm sure there's going to be an option in between. I would also think that a small room where a student can go and record with their Chromebook would also work. Um, but it's, it's a prototyping and experimenting. Yeah. My dream world would be that my contact students could help support making learning objects everywhere and that they'd be inspired to do so. I'm not sure based on my library that that comes naturally unless it's integrated and they really own that experience as well. I can't quite hire them out just yet. Right. Right. <laughs> Unless you feed them lunch. So in Illustrator, that's a Google, uh, is that a Google app or is that a? That's a software, oh. that's just an example of learning software. So Illustrator is something that we teach in a contact classroom. Okay. Um, the reason why I have it here is really that concept of how do you learn something, the how-to videos um, is more of a because I, I, I was just thinking, like, so I, I teach drama, so we've just finished, like, all of the different drama elements, and I was thinking, that might be an interesting kind of end of that chunk of the course assignment, that they make their own how-to videos about the different yeah. sections. Um, I'm using Chromebooks with my grade 9, so do you have a, an add-on that you would suggest so for that? So the Screenomatic should work on Screen your Chromebooks, okay. yeah, and I should put that on my PowerPoint, I'll try and hide that as well. That we use to make the screencast. The screencast, okay. yeah. And it just records the video. And you know what I would do with my students too is I would often say, I'm not going to figure it out at 12 o'clock at night. Three students who I know are technically savvy, could you go figure this out and then teach me? Right. Right. I often ask my students, go figure this out, come back and teach me, and then teach anybody. So you had them do the how to's from the transition to Illustrator, yeah. and then you said oh, that freed up what would have been like two weeks. Mm -hmm. So what did you fill that two weeks with? So I, I the year after the my students were doing morning announcements, yeah. uh, they are in period B. So half my class would be out okay. working on morning announcements. I also do a visual a video module where I'll rotate them through different sort of experiments. Okay. So they had the opportunity to go through all those pre-made learning object videos yeah. and that took the place in short of your lesson time? Yes. And it also allowed me to use my resources differently. Um, in an ideal world for some, I would have one computer to one student in a contact world, but I don't have that often. So this allows me to have some computers that are group work and others that are individual and then I can split into. So it, it spreads out my resources. Yeah. 
I really like this for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is, um, earlier today we were talking about how one of the strategic priorities was emphasizing well-being for not only students but also for staff. And I really liked how you said um, that it really sort of lessened the, the um, I don't want to use the word, word, but it made your life a little bit easier as a teacher because you're putting a little bit more of the responsibility on the students, yes. which is better for their learning. Yes. It makes, I would assume, your life a little bit easier because you're sort of providing the, the framework, but you're not actually doing the majority of the work. Um, and so I am an art and photography teacher, and you're talking about and showing examples about how teaching the illustrator and having students create these videos can be um, a really great experience for them. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can do this with Photoshop in my photography class. Yes. You can do exactly the same thing. Absolutely. And it provides a really nice differentiated instruction platform whereby students can start wherever they want to or need to. Some photography students might be you know, at the very base, and maybe they never even held a camera before, and then some might have been using it, you know, for the last five years, and they've had it at home, or they had parents who are into photography or something like that. So um, I love the differentiation that's available yes. for our class as well. Yes. And, and the community that happens when you can hear voices that you know from yeah. the year before, or you come across your own video, like it helps broaden, yeah, the community. It's probably exciting for them too, right? Because they're thinking, like, I'm creating something that's going to be used for other students for my peers. Yes. Like a really good, really it makes it more of an interesting product. Yeah. Yes. What's the I'm in the Chrome store now? What's it called? Screen. So it's from a website. It won't be in the Chrome oh. store exactly. So it's called Screenomatic. Okay. And I can bring it up here. So it looks like this. Sometimes you have to download something like a little package. And this is where I would definitely take three students and say, go figure this out, come back and teach. Or find something better. Okay, are we almost at time? I feel like. We did like three minutes and 22 seconds. Three minutes and 22 <laughs> seconds. There we go. Yeah. Um, do you have a course website that you use where you're more about the people? Like I think it, I saw weekly or something like that. Is that like your teaching website or is that course yeah. That's that's my course website. Um, and so I have lots of different sort of sections to it. Oh, it's a good cleaning. Okay. Um, but that's where I post it. Um, everything's always shifting for me and partly I get bored in one way and then the other, but I do like my course web with things that are static and get reused, whereas when my Google Classroom becomes my wall garden where I can have more of a private discussion with my okay. students and I will link to my website okay. uh, in my Google Classroom. So they create a video yeah. and share it with you somehow or would they upload it directly? I can give the power for my students to upload directly, and if I was to give you a suggestion, I would have one or two students that are ahead of the ball and get them to be your website creators, so okay. they're uploading videos. Um, Google Drive works like a Dropbox, so that yeah. they can upload it to Google Drive, share it with you, and then you can download it and re-upload it that way, or link it. You, YouTube is also another option, I just I didn't go to the YouTube option. Because I, I was still getting comfortable with the YouTube option, so it was my yeah. safety feeling. Yes, sort of related, but sort of not, as a photography teacher as well. Have you found any good sort of apps or um, programs on the Google platform for photo editing, Photoshop? Because for, for us, we're, we're going to be using labs and desktop computers as this one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative sort of develops. And it's and just scary. I mean, I'm a little bit scared, yeah, because right, they won't be updating um, desktops anymore. There's no replacement cycle anymore. There's no parts and catsy because of this unforeseen expense with the one to one uh, Chromebooks. Um, so I'm wondering, do you know of any, sort of an aside, it's kind of like, you, know, you know who, the, I feel like the best person yeah. to speak to that is Inestis Podopolis at okay. KCI. Yeah. KCI. Because I, I know that he's teach the he has taught the grade ten communication mm -hmm. technology course online. Yeah. Um, and has used open software, free software for yeah. several years. And so I think he holds part of the key to figuring that out. So KCI. KCI. I know that the students are great resources too because they're sort of on the cutting edge of whatever is coming out, and they're they're also. Uh, and I and I think we're like I think. Um, I was at the CATSI meeting when that came out and had discussions. Yeah. I think there are 
my message that I'm hearing, but it's all a bit of an echo chamber right now, yeah. is that there will always be a place for higher end uh, computers and software. Mm -hmm. I think that's important, but I think some of the concepts and the building concepts might shift from yeah. that you can shift into different software. Yeah. And that's what we have to figure out and explore, yeah. but that is a, a new hill to figure out. You know, the client. Sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah, question. Um, so I just finished teaching illustrator on communication technology as well. Yeah. Um, so have you moved away from teaching software, um, like actually giving a tutorial, or do you let the students, because I I don't think the students really got a lot out of my tutorial in my unit on illustrator. Like I think I could have done so much more, and I love this idea of them doing a screencast. So it's changed how I talk about learning software. I, but the first unit is learning software and how do we learn, and I'll illustrate different ways of learning. So I will support um, direct instruction, uh, sandboxing, just to sort of play around, some of the skill builders, understanding some of the concepts of player organization, okay. and I will get them to collect a body of evidence that then they can post on their own portfolio. And so I've had to shift to a learning portfolio so they can document what their pathway has been, because it's not project A, project B, project mm -hmm. C. Yeah. And I quite like it because I'm so tired of seeing the same project again and again. Yeah. This allows me to see the variety. And then I, I like to have them choose a project or choose a skill set that they want to accomplish. So to bring in this idea of growth mindset. Yeah. Choose something a little bit harder, find a tutorial, find your resource, figure out what it is you want to do, and go for that, and then document your learning. I'm big on them taking screenshots as they go through yeah. so that they can tell me where they've been and make their thinking explicit later on. Otherwise, it looks all the same, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the last thought that came to mind, so it's more the, the concepts of having that software, and part of it is that feeling like the software is always going to change. Yes. And what's industry standard today will be different tomorrow, so you need to be able to understand vector versus um, bitmap or you know, and file types, but shift. Okay. Okay. That was context specific, sorry. That's good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.